we can get started whenever you're ready. All right. Welcome to Thursday Grand Rounds uh, for the Department of Internal Medicine. Um, this is a wonderful talk coming up here. Very pertinent for all of us. Uh, all of us are going to be returning to travel. A lot of us who have not traveled during the pandemic. So this talk of fever and a returning traveler is even a, a nicer review because some of us, like I said, are rusty in leaving the continental U.S. the last several years. So um, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Uh, Manal Asin. Uh, Dr. Asin is a uh, University of Miami double graduate, so did her undergraduate there and medical school. And we were very lucky to have her finish her medicine and pediatrics residency in 2015. Um, so, um, um, and uh, Dr. Asin uh, has done awesome work in refugee health and in global health, and also rose to the assistant director position of the TGH main hospitalist, uh, and was very involved in our COVID-19 response uh, for the TGH main team. Uh, congratulations as well as she was uh, recently promoted to associate professor of medicine in recognition of her fantastic work uh, in such a uh, early uh, slew of her career here. So we are very, very lucky to have uh, Manal, who was a, an outstanding resident uh, with us. Uh, hard to believe it's been almost eight years since she graduated. Time flies. Um, she's going to give us a wonderful talk on fever in the returning traveler. Uh, take it away, Dr. Asin. Thank you, Dr. Lazama, for that kind introduction. Um, let me share my screen. Thank. Okay. Looks good. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, so hi everyone. Thank you, Dr. Lazama, for that introduction. Thank you all for taking time this afternoon to be here. Um, I know uh, we're all cutting, getting back in the swing of things after the holidays and we're kind of, everybody's really busy. So I really appreciate you being here today for this topic. Um, so as Dr. Lazama gave you a little bit of background about me, I'm from the University of Miami. I actually did my master's in public health um, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, I finished my residency. I started in New Jersey and I finished up here in 2015. Um, but this past fall, I actually was lucky to go back to London for a diploma in tropical medicine and hygiene. It's a 12 week course. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second, but I was really lucky to go back to London to complete that. Um, and I thought about kind of um, how I could come back and share information that was pertinent to all of our practice. And this is the topic that I came up with. So a little plug for the DTMNH. Um, so what is it? It's a, prof a professional diploma in tropical medicine and public health for physicians. It combines lab work, lectures, and seminars, um, a little bit of clinical experience to provide professional competence in tropical medicine. And it's designed for physicians who intend to work in the tropics um, who need clinical parasitology um, and travel medicine experience. So um, as I'd mentioned, this was a 12 week course um, in London. Uh, I had about 70 colleagues from all over the world, all physicians that joined. Um, and I think one of the best things about the course was not just learning from uh, the professors and the course instructors, but also learning from my colleagues and seeing the cool things that they're doing all over the world. And um, for me, uh, my work in refugee health and humanitarian medicine, this was very pertinent. Um, and I thought about how, like I said, to how can we um, apply some of what I learned to our practice here in Tampa? Dr. Austin, your mic just turned off. <laughs> Thank you, sorry. Um, <laughs> so the goal of this talk is not to discuss every possible infection that could be inquire, acquired during international travel. Um, if you're interested in that, I would encourage you to pursue the DTMNH. Um, but the goal of this presentation really is to share some knowledge um, that's relevant to um, our practice in Tampa, especially um, as we receive international travels from the airport and our cruise ships. 
So what we will discuss today is the epidemiology of fevers in returning travelers, discuss some of the challenges in this population, discuss a systemic systematic approach to evaluation of fevers in these patients, describe risk factors for contracting fever during travel, discuss diagnosis, treatment and prevention, and review examples of clinical cases. So about estimates indicate that about 50 to 37% of short-term travelers experience a health problem during an international trip. And about 11% of return travelers have a febrile illness. The majority of travels with fever have infections that are common in non-travelers like upper respiratory tract infections, UTIs, and community acquired pneumonias. About 10 to 42 percent of travelers to any destination and about 15 to 70 percent of travelers to tropical set settings experience ill health, either while abroad or while out upon their return home. Immigrants who are visiting friends and relatives in their country of origin are at high risk of infections. More than 70 percent of malaria cases in the U.S. and U.K. and up to 90 percent of enteric fever diagnoses in the U.K. are attributable to people who have traveled to their country of origin. GI and respiratory symptoms are the most common complaints. And most illnesses are self-limiting. However, between 12 and 54 percent of patients are ill enough to seek medical attention and one to six percent of these patients are hospitalized. So once routine infections have been considered, the differential diagnosis should be expanded to include travel related infections. The causes of fever in returning travelers are largely derived from studies of patients presenting to specialist centers and natu national mandatory reporting of specific travel associated infections. The Geo Sentinel Network represents the most extensive global real time surveillance database of travel related morbidity, encompassing more than 60 travel medicine clinics around the world. So patients presenting to specialist centers most likely reflect the severe end of the illness spectrum and patients accessing primary care or general hospitals or with self-limiting illnesses usually are more likely underrepresented in the literature that I'm going to present. So from this GeoSentinel network, we have learned that about a third have confirmed GI, respiratory tract, or GU infections. A third have systematic systemic febrile illness attributable to a specific diagnosis, such as malaria or other illnesses and bacteremia has been reported in 5 to 10 percent of returning travelers managed in secondary care. A substantial portion of patients remain undiagnosed between 21 and 40 percent, possibly because relevant diagnostic tests were not performed on presentation or these patients have had self-limiting illnesses that are um, that don't require further investigation. Malaria is the most common specific diagnosis made in febrile return travelers, accounting for 5 to 29 percent of all individuals presenting to specialist clinics and 26 to 75 percent of patients hospitalized with this systemic febrile illness. Most patients with malaria are infected are infected with plasmid Plasmodium falciparum, a life threatening infection that accounts for 25 to 55% of deaths in febrile returning travelers. After malaria, dengue, enteric fever, and rickettsial infections are the commonest specific diagnoses made. However, a wide range of low frequency, potentially life threatening infections should also be considered in the differential diagnosis. So there was another study about of 3,655 cases. Of these, falciparum malaria accounted for 77% of the 3,655 cases. Enteric fever uh, with salmonella, um, it accounted for 18%. 13 patients, about 0.4% died. 10 of these had falciparum malaria. Two had melioidosis, which thinking back to medical school, is an uncommon bacterial infection caused by the bacteria Burkholderia pseudomaliae. This disease affects humans and animals and is acquired through direct contact with contaminated soil and surface waters. We had an entire uh, lecture or two about this during our course. Um, and then 
uh, one percent had severe one person had severe dengue. Uh, falciparum malaria was acquired mainly in West Africa, and enteric fever was contracted largely on the Indian subcontinent. Travelers in the study had predominantly visited developing countries and were seen at travel clinics, which skewed the results. The challenge presented by returning travelers with febrile illnesses is changing for a few reasons. Firstly, increasing numbers of travelers are older than 60 years of age or are seeking health care elsewhere, such as med medical tourism. These travelers are more likely than others to have clinically significant coexisting conditions and consequently increase morbidity from infections. Between 18 and 26 percent of travel clinic attendees in Europe and North America have some kind of pre-existing condition, such as lung disease or diabetes, and about what between 1 percent and 4 percent are immunocompromised, secondary to conditions such as cancer, HIV, or transplant. Live vaccines are often contraindicated in these patients, and response to an activated vaccine can be impaired, making them vulnerable to infections. Secondly, the likelihood of multi-drug resistance in infection infecting organisms is increasing, as we are seeing now with MDRTB globally and many other illnesses. Also, with the recent COVID-19 pandemic, Ebola epidemics in West Africa, the emergence of MERS, the re-emergence of Zika, chikungunya, they've all highlighted the importance of being alert to the possibility that of an emerging path pathogen as the cause of a fever. So what is the process of evaluating a patient? If we get a, a traveler that's come off an airplane or come off a cruise ship that has been traveling internationally, how should we approach them? So the first step should be triage, figuring out whether or not this patient has something life-threatening that needs to be treated inpatient versus outpatient. Um, can this be treated if they are admitted to in the floor versus the ICU? Um, and then lastly, figuring out their comorbidities. How does that impact what kind of uh, diagnostic tests we need to do, what kind of further workup is needed, or whether or not they need closer monitoring. So if the patient has factors that increase the risk of sepsis-related mortality, these patients might benefit uh, by more closer observation or inpatient care. Um, one way, uh, this is a nice illustration from the British Medical Journal of our first step. So using the QSOFA score, which is the quick sepsis-related organ failure assessment, um, and basically you get one point each for low blood pressure, so an SBP less than 100, high respiratory rate or a respiratory rate above 22, um, altermentation or a Glasgow Corma scale score of less than 15, greater than e or equal to two points near the onset of an infection is associated with greater risk of death or prolonged stay in the ICU. So after we've assessed the patient, then we follow the local sepsis pathway, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later, but consider empiric therapy and referrals to maybe the ICU. And then obviously taking keeping in mind the patient's other comorbidities. Next, it's important to um, figure out whether or not this patient needs to be isolated. And this is done by obtaining a detailed travel history to identify exposure to potential risks and evaluate the need to isolate. So we should be observing contact precautions for any febrile patient who has traveled internationally with diarrhea or vomiting, acute respiratory symptoms, a rash, wound or skin infections, or travel to a region where viral hemorrhagic fever is endemic in the last 21 days, or if they've recently been hospitalized overseas. This is because a lot of organisms overseas are um, you know, susceptible to uh, different drugs than maybe here. Uh, there may be different um, uh, resistance profiles, so it's important that they are isolated until that can be figured out. Uh, precautions include use of PPE by healthcare workers and carers when available, and private room isolation if possible. Surgical face masks should be worn for all acute respiratory infections. Negative pressure single room isolation and N95 respirators are recommended for suspected acute respiratory infections with pandemic potential, such as as we see, saw with COVID-19, novel influenza viruses such as the avian flu, and other novel infections such as MERS. 
If viral hemorrhagic fever is suspected, isolate the patient in a single room. Staff must use enhanced PPE to include a head, foot, and eye protection. And the lab should be informed regarding isolation precautions while handling samples. Confirmed cases are transferred to high-level isolation units. Next um, is getting a detailed travel history. Questions about travel history should focus on the patient's exact itinerary, reason for travel, and accommodations. So first of all, uh, where did they travel? The risk of acquiring travel-related infections depends on the precise geographical location and the length of stay at each destination. Specific regions visited within each country should be determined because some infections are focally transmitted and risk is only present when traveling in the endemic area. For example, malaria may, only, uh, may be a risk factor only in rural areas of a certain country. The CDC website details specific infections that are found in different locations. Infections can also be acquired en route, so layovers and intermediate stops should be identified. The type of transportation is also relevant because outbreaks of many types of infections have been linked to specific, specifically to airplanes, trains, and cruise ships. And then also, when did you travel? Seasonality is really important. Did you travel during monsoon season when there are more mosquitoes breeding and more likely to be at risk for malaria or more maybe, you know, sewage out in um, out because of uh, poor sanitation, poor hygiene? Um, nextly, what was your purpose of your travel? Why did you go there? Determining the reason for travel can assist in assess assessing the risk of certain infections. The purpose of the trip may affect the duration of travel the likelihood of travel to isolated and rural areas, and the likelihood of recreational risk factors, such as cave diving, exposure to animals, and sexual contacts. Next, where did you stay? Travelers who stay in modern hotels and major urban centers generally have fewer exposures than backpackers or volunteer workers who spend significant time in rural settings with the local population. Persons who visit family and friends while abroad are also at increased risk of becoming ill because they stay in homes away from usual tourist routes. And lastly, what risk factors were you exposed to? The risk of acquiring tropical infection is affected by the patient's activities during travel. Because many tropical illnesses have nonspecific signs and symptoms, identification of a unique exposure may provide the only clue to the correct diagnosis. Activities in remote areas increase the chance of exposure to insect vectors and freshwater lakes and streams that may harbor, for example, schistosomes or leptospores. In addition, eating certain foods increasing, increases the risk for foodborne illnesses. Patients' awareness of illnesses among fellow travelers or exposures to sick contacts may also provide a diagnostic clue. So what are some specific risk factors that travelers may be exposed to while they're overseas? First of all, um, unclean water or undercooked food. So consumption of unclean water or undercooked food may be associated with travelers' diarrhea, giardia, enteric fever, non-typhoidal salmonellosis, shigellosis, Campylobacter, Hep A and E, and dysentery. Consumption of unpasteurized milk may be associated with listeria, brucellosis, Q fever, or tick-borne encephalitis. Next, what about bites? There's so many things that can, so many vectors that can transmit infection. Um, for example, just to name a few, but you know, mosquitoes can transmit malaria, dengue, chikungunya, Zika, yellow fever, West Nile, Japanese encephalitis, the list goes on and on. Um, you know, the sand fly can transmit leishmaniasis, African sleeping sickness, um, a royal fever. Um, ticks can transmit rickettsial infections, Lyme disease, babesiosis, ehrlichiosis. Uh, fleas can transmit uh, typhus, mur murine typhus, and the plague. And then lice can also tra uh, transmit Bartonella and Borrelia. Um, and funny fact, actually, during uh, our diploma in tropical medicine, uh, part of our lab practical was actually to identify um, these different vectors, what species of mosquito it was, uh, what type of tick it was, and be able to tell if it was male or female, so uh, that we're well prepared when we go out into the field. 
So animal exposures, so animal bites may be associated with transmission of rabies via dogs, bats, or other mammals, cat scratch fever with Bartonella, rat bite fever, and simian herpes virus. Contact with animals may also be associated with transmission of toxoplasmosis, anthrax, Q fever with cattle, sheep, and goats, hantavirus with rodents, um, psittacosis with birds, and uh, avian influenza. And lastly, sexual contacts. Sexual contact with new partners has been reported by up to one half of young people who visit tropical regions. This contact can result in exposure to STIs. And although STIs usually present with genital lesions, occasionally only fever and nonspecific symptoms may be noted. So the clinical history should include um, a sexual history, including number of partners, type of sexual activities, and whether or not barrier, barrier protection was used. So um, I pulled these charts that on the next few pages from the British Medical Journal. Um, they had a really nice article on fever and a returning traveler, and I thought it really divided up nicely. Um, you know, this particular one was about uh, risk factors and exposures and uh, what infection you could potentially get. Um, the plus sign is high risk. So, you know, um, it's a nice way to organize kind of your thought process to break it up by um, the type of exposure so that you can narrow down what you're looking at. This next one is actually by travel destination, which, um, you know, there's many of these available all over the internet. Um, CDC has a lot of really good resources. Um, the Infectious Disease Society of America has a lot of good resources, um, but this particular one breaks it down by region um, and viral, bacterial, and other organism infections. And then again, the plus sign indicates the high risk. And this particular chart I really liked as well is about disease incubation time. So a patient, you know, comes back to you, um, part of the history. Um, so we talked about the travel history, but when we get um, the history of symptoms is going to be when symptoms started. When were they exposed to whatever potential risk factor um, there was? And then when did symptoms start after that? So incubation period is going to be um, really important in determining um, and helping kind of give clues to our workup. And this is a nice um, chart that the CDC had, but it's a differential diagnosis based on symptoms. So if a patient presents with fever and rash, we can possibly narrow it down to maybe dengue, chikungunya, Zika, and a few other um, illnesses that are listed here. If they present with fever and hemorrhage, we maybe we should be thinking about viral hemorrhagic fevers like dengue and others, leptospirosis, rickettsial infections, or meningococcemia. Um, if they present with fever and altered mental status, what kind of things should we think about? Scrub typhus, viral or bacterial meningitis, um, arboviral infections, uh, African sleeping sickness. So, um, you know, break, kind of putting the pieces, physical uh, exam and diagnostic test pieces together um, can help lead us to um, our diagnosis. So in terms of the physical exam, look for clues. We may not have a lot to work with, but you know whatever we can glean between the history and the physical, obviously, um, not just in travel medicine, in all medicine will be helpful in kind of leading us down the right path. Um, many important infections have nonspecific febrile presentation. However, certain exam findings can provide clues to underlying diagnoses. For example, with vital signs, um, the pulse rate that is slow for the degree of fever, which is called pulse temperature dissociation, may suggest typhoid fever or rickettsial disease. Uh, when we're looking at rashes, a macular papular rash may be present in many travel-related illnesses, such as dengue, leptospirosis, typhus, as well as acute HIV and acute hepatitis. Uh, drug eruption should also be considered. These are rose spots. Rose spots are basically crops of pink map macules, two to three millimeters in diameter on the chest or abdomen and can suggest typhoid fever. An SCAR or basically a black necrotic ulcer with erythematous margins may be present in many rickettsial diseases. Patients with dengue, meningococcemia, and viral hemorrhagic fevers may present with petechiae, ecchymosis, or hemorrhagic lesions. 
The eyes should be examined for evidence of conjunctivitis. Sinuses and ears and teeth are common sites of occult infection, and attention to these areas can help avoid unnecessary testing for travel-related causes of infection. Auscultation of the lungs should focus on detection of inspiratory clackles, wheezes, and whereas the auscultation of the heart should focus on detection of a murmur, maybe indicating a subacute bacterial endocarditis. Splenomegaly is associated with many diseases, but few examples are mono, malaria, visceral leishmaniasis, typhoid fever, and brucellosis. Lymph nodes um, may be diagnostically helpful or may just indicate kind of a generalized um, infection. Then obviously uh, altered mental status and a return traveler may represent a medical emergency and may put them up on that QSOFA score to be admitted to an ICU. Routine investigations include a CBC with differential, playing close attention to eosinophilia, serum inflammatory markers, blood cultures, and imaging tests as, such as chest, uh, chest x-rays. Uh, same day malaria testing should be performed in all patients with geographical risk, regardless of reported adherence to anti-malarial prophylaxis. The sensitivity of rapid diagnostic tests is high, particularly for Plasmodium falciparum. However, microscopy continues to be the gold standard for diagnosis of malaria. Thick and thin blood spill films should be obtained to determine parasitemia, maturity, and species. If the first blood spills are negative and malaria is still suspected, smears should be repeated every eight to 12 hours for several days. Specific additional tests such as uh, blood for PCR and serological testing should be based on the initial assessment and clinical um, suspicion. Because most viral and rickettsial infections are diagnosed by demonstrating an antibody response, storing a tube of serum drawn when the patient is first evaluated or the acute phase sample may provide diagnosis when a sample is obtained at a later date, the convalescent phase sample, and the samples are compared. So this chart from the BMJ shows some common infections, clinical presentations, diagnostic testing, and uh, empiric antibiotic regimens. Um, I wanna focus on the bottom line here because these are all, the top few are disease specific, um, but empiric treatment of patients with suspected life-threatening infections should be driven by the clinical, expo uh, clinical picture and likely exposure. If severe sepsis is suspected, local and national guidelines should be followed with modifications for any differences in the prevalence of antimicrobial resistance in the geographic location visited. For example, Enterobacter that produce ESBL are highly prevalent in many developing countries and travelers to such countries are at risk for colonization with these resistant bacteria, particularly if travelers were hospitalized or received antibiotic treatment for travelers diarrhea. If local guidelines for the treatment of community-acquired sepsis do not include a carbapenem, this should be given to patients if the patient has traveled to an area uh, where ESBL is highly prevalent, such as South or Southeast Asia. Similarly, melioidosis, as I'd mentioned previously, caused by Burkholderia, Burkholderia pseudomaliae is a common cause of sepsis in parts of Southeast Asia, and suspected infection should be treated with a carbapenem or septazidine since the bacteria are intrinsically resistant to most beta-lactame antibiotics and to aminoglycosides. If severe scrub typhus, another rickettsial infection, is suspected, doxycycline should be added to the empiric regimen since Orientia tsutsumagushi uh, and rickettsial species are intrinsically resistant to the beta-lactams. Um, that was uh, definitely, that showed up on our uh, DTM and H exam many times. So now that we have uh, an approach to a patient with um, fever that has traveled. Let's look at a few cases. And this part is going to require some audience participation. I'm going to pause and ask you to um, log in in your chat. There's actually um, a link that you can click, or if you go to menti.com, there's a code that you can put in. And I'm going to stop and ask you guys for some questions. 
And these cases, by the way, are all pulled from literature. These were all cases found in Western countries after travelers have, after people have returned from traveling. So case one is a 67 year old female who presented to the ER after recently returning from Western Africa. Her chief complaint was fatigue and subjective fevers for the past two days. This was associated with headaches. She denied chills, rigors, or chest pain. A more detailed travel history, she returned five days ago after travel to her home country of Togo, and she was there for five months. She's a diabetic and has hypertension. Surgical history includes a left breast mastectomy many years ago in France. Um, her current medications um, are amlodipine, aspirin, um, and some di uh, diabetic medications and lisinopril, as well as insulin. You can see she's on Humalog. So she was admitted by internal medicine, transferred to the general medical floor. On admission, her blood pressure, pulse, temperature, and respiratory rate were all stable. Physical exam did not disclose any specific abnormalities. White blood cell count was just over normal. <laughs> Hemoglobin was a little low at 10.7. Platelets were low at 80. Uh, creatinine and BUN were normal. And she had a mildly elevated blood glucose and expected in a diabetic of 291. So this is where I want your participation, please. What diagnostic tests would you order next? Those of you still on, it's uh, the link is in the chat to um, click and please enter the diagnostic test that you would order. Okay, so I see some coming up. Okay, malaria blood film. I see a couple of blood cultures, blood smear. So it seems like people are thinking along the same line, blood smear. Anyone else? Okay, so I think Malaria blood film, urine sample, good. All right, common things being common, excellent. So as you can see, so Menti is really cool. So the more people that put in the same answer, it gets larger. So I think a lot of people are um, blood smear and malaria blood film, I think are the same. So that seems to be a very common response um, and blood culture. So let me find my presentation again. Okay, so I think most people got it. So this uh, case was pointing towards malaria. As I mentioned in the beginning, most common cause of fever in uh, travelers returning from um, malaria endemic regions. So um, this is a malaria slide. It's a thin blood smear. 
Um, and my um, part of our DTM and H was actually to we spent um, we had twice a week sessions in the lab looking at these smears and uh, part of what we were examined on was differentiating between species of malaria, stages of malaria. Um, so by the end of our um, course, uh, my classmates and I were, were pretty good at this. So um, this, if you look at the smear, um, some of the things that our instructor taught us um, were that if you look at the red blood cells, you can notice the ones the parasites inside. If the ones with the parasites, if you compare them to the ones without the parasites, they're not enlarged. They're about the same size. Um, so that's one clue to what species of malaria this is. As well as the parasite that's inside, you can see um, ring form. This is the trophozoite stage. So you can see these ring forms. They look like signet rings. These look like headphones. So um, this is the trophozoite. Um, and these kind of dark pigments that you see in um, the cells are called Maurer's clefts. So when you put those kind of things together, this leads you to the diagnosis of uh, Plasmodium falciparum. So this particular patient um, was actually um, admitted in New York. Um, she returned from Togo. Um, the blood smear, so part of um, when you diagnose malaria and you look at blood smears, you actually come up with a percentage of parasitemia. And depending on how much percent it is indicates your level of severity. So she, her um, blood smears confirmed 9.6%, which you do this by looking at many kind of visual fields and counting them and um, counting basically the parasites and calculating a percentage. So um, she was at 9.6%. The New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene was contacted and Ebola was not considered to be in Togo. So the most likely diagnosis was malaria from, from a chloroquine resistant region. The patient was discharged on quinine and doxycycline. Um, she was given IV fluids while admitted. She clinically improved and then she was discharged home. Sorry, she was started on quinine and doxycycline and then once she improved, she discharged home. So this one thing that we learned in tropical medicine, every um, disease, every infection has a map that's associated with it. So this is a map of malaria, um, malaria endemic regions. As you can see, it's kind of um, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and in South America. Um, the little symbols indicate resistance patterns and Togo is right here in between Benin and Ghana in West Africa. Um, this is an area, um, as uh, I previously said, was is where there is chloroquine resistance. Um, so if a patient had been on you know, chloroquine for prophylaxis, perhaps um, they may have presented with symptoms despite being on prophylaxis. So what are some takeaway points for us um, practicing the states with malaria? So one thing that I kind of was shocked about when I did my the DTM and H was that um, malaria, you know, we don't really talk about it much in the U.S. because we don't see it. I think we had one case at TGH um, a few months ago and that, you know, became the talk of everyone has been talking about that case, um, but there is an estimated 247 million cases worldwide, mostly in Africa. And um, of these, there were about 619,000 deaths last year, and it continues to carry a disproportionately high rate of global, um, Africa continues to carry a disproportionately high rate of the global malaria burden. About, um, it carried about 95% of all malaria cases and 96% of all deaths. And children under five years of age accounted for about 80% of all malaria deaths in the region. So in areas where, falciparum malaria is not endemic, a delay in diagnosis is very common and may have fatal consequences. As a priority, malaria should be actively ruled out in all travelers returning from regions where it is endemic, regardless of whether or not they've been receiving chemoprophylaxis. Thick and thin blood smell sh smears should be tested with the testing repeated twice if results are negative and even more often if needed. 
Malaria can be diagnosed within minutes with a rapid diagnostic test that can be performed at the bedside or at the lab. These tests are particularly useful in areas where local expertise in microscopic examination for malaria is in short supply, though the result should be confirmed by assessment of a blood smear. Signs of se severe malaria include altered mental status, shock, acidosis, severe anemia, hypoglycemia, evidence of vital or organ dysfunction, or high paracetamia levels, which is greater than 10%. The lady that we just discussed, she was 9.6%. 9 so she didn't quite meet the presentation, but clinically she appeared well or better than a severe patient. In adults, children, and pregnant women, severe malaria should be treated promptly with parenteral artesanate, which has been shown to reduce mortality and substantially, substantially as compared with quinine. This is followed by a course of oral artisanal based combination therapy when oral medication can be taken reliably. The FDA has not approved the use of artisanate in the US, but it is available through the CDC malaria hotline. The preferred anti-malarial for interim oral treatment is Arthemeter um, lumefantrine or coartum because of its fast um, onset of action. Other oral options include etovacone progonil, which is malarone, quinine, and methylquin. IV or oral clinda or tetracycline, such as doxycycline, are not adequate for interim, uh, interim treatment. These drugs are slow acting and they don't take effect until well after 24 hours, and they are not effective anti-malarials for treatment of severe malaria when used alone. As for malaria treatment, the interim regimen should not include the medication used for chemoprophylaxis if possible. So um, this I actually pulled from the New England Journal. Um, they, they had an article on malaria chemoprophylaxis. So as you can see, there's a lot of options, various medications that are available. And you know, depending on a patient's clinical status and the comorbidities um, would indicate um, and as uh, how long they're traveling, cost, um, and uh, how long they want to be taking, how often they want to be taking the medication. These are all factors that you should discuss with a patient when determining which medication they want to take for chemoprophylaxis. For example, methylquin um, is not recommended for patients that have had recent depression or a history of psychosis or a seizure disorder. Um, so that's something that you'd want to stay away from. Um, you know, doxycycline, as we know from using it as an antibiotic, um, can cause photosensitivity and gastritis as well as esophagitis, but it's really cheap. So maybe that's something that, you know, um, that outweighs the, the, um, the downside of it. Um, a lot of these medications, as you see too, um, can be initiated just one to two days prior to travel, whereas mefloquine, because it is a weekly medication, needs to be initiated three weeks per, uh, prior to travel. A lot of this is actually to make sure that um, they don't have any side effects uh, while traveling um, so that uh, you can, the patient gets used to the medication. So a lot of these factors, there's a lot of different, um, you know, um, things to discuss with patients prior to initiation of a chemoprophylaxis regimen. Case two, a 29 year old female law student was referred to a travel clinic with a two week history of severe frontal headache and high grade fevers reaching 41 Celsius or 106 Fahrenheit. Um, those of us in med peds know that 106 is very common in kids, but not common in a 29 year old. She denied diarrhea, bloody discharge, or abdominal cramps, no weight changes or high-risk sexual behavior, no previous history of diseases, and she's not taking any medication. Her travel history include that included that she returned three weeks prior from a three-month trip to New Delhi, India for an inter internship. During her trip, she didn't take any antibiotics and she was not on any malaria prophylaxis. Before traveling, she had received all recommended vaccinations, including for typhoid fever and hepatitis A. Um, on initial presentation, her clinical exam was unremarkable. Her lab showed a normal WBC, mildly decreased platelets at 112, and a rapid malaria test was negative. Serum antibodies against typhoid fever, the ONH antigens, which a cutoff of 1 to 200, HIV, HSV1 and 2, 
dengue fever and hepatitis C were all negative. Stool microscopy, stool culture, and specific antigen assays were unremarkable for pathologic bacteria, viral antigens, worms, or protozoa. So the patient returned to clinic five days later with continued fever and headaches. She then also complained of bone and muscle pain, abdominal discomfort, and constipation. So at this point, we've already done some initial workup. What diagnostic tests would you order? So if you can go back to Menti, please, and uh, fill it out. Let's see what you're thinking. Okay, blood cultures, chikungunya PCR, thin and thick smear, all good thoughts. What else? Inflammatory markers, blood smear, okay. As we said, repeat malaria testing multiple times. Um, but blood culture seems to be at the forefront. So let's run with that. Nucleic acid amplification test for dengue. Great, I see that. So, um, at this point, blood cultures were obtained and she was admitted to the medical floors. On exam at this point, her temperature was 38.3 or 101 Fahrenheit. Pulse was 90, blood pressure was stable at 114 over 76. Her abdomen was slightly tense with reduced bowel sounds, no hepatos hepatosplenomegaly. Otherwise, her exam was unremarkable. Her lab so showed a significantly elevated CRP of 142, elevated transaminitis, uh, some tr transaminitis, AST of 80, ALT of 50, LDH of 170, mildly decreased platelets of 109, her white blood cell count was 4.8 uh, with a normal differential um, and uh, no eosinophils. Urinalysis, stool microscopy, and culture were again negative. She was empirically started on IV ciprofloxacin, 500 milligrams twice daily, and then she was switched to oral regimen after a few days. And her antibody test results, including the Widal test, were again negative. Five days later, so at this hospital, it took a long time to get blood cultures back, but five days later, three out of four blood cultures returned positive for pan-sensitive Salmonella uh, enterica cerovar typhi. On the same day, the fever decreased and the headaches resolved. Repeated stool cultures were negative for Salmonella. The patient was discharged after seven days in improved condition. So this case was actually described in a law student in Germany. So as I mentioned, tropical medicine, there's a lot of maps. So this is the map of um, typhoid and endemic regions or enteric fever. Um, you can see there is drug resistance that is emerging in certain parts. So 
So despite being rarely seen in Western world hospitals, infection with S salmonella typhi remains a global health issue and an important differential diagnosis in patients that return from tropical destinations. The WHO estimates about 22 million cases and 200,000 deaths per year worldwide from enteric fever. In endemic countries, the diagnosis of typhoid fever is often based upon clinical presentation, which can include high fever, headache, stomach pain, and constipation or diarrhea. Uh, the diagnosis gold standard is a bone marrow culture, which is rarely obtained, as we see. Usually it's a blood culture that's obtained, but this was actually one of my exam questions. But classic, uh, the classic serological test, the Vodal test, um, was actually first described in 1896 by Felix Vodal, and it's easy and cheap, um, but it's counterbalanced by really poor sensitivity and specificity. Uh, specificity. The Vodal test detect, uh, detects agglutinating antibodies against the O and H antigens of Salmonella typhi and the H antigens of Paratyphi A and B. In general, a four time rise within seven to 10 days in the agglutinin titer is considered to be positive. The Waddell test as a diagnostic modality has suboptimal sensitivity and specificity. It can be negative up to 30% of culture proven cases of typhoid fever. Suboptimal sensitivity results from the negativity and in early infection uh, due to prior antibiotic therapy and failure to an amount an immune response by certain individuals. Poor sensitivity is an even greater problem. And this is likely due to cross reactivity with other gram negative infections and non uh, typhoidal salmonella, prior, uh, prior antibiotic treatment, and oral typhoid vaccination. So, notwithstanding these problems, the withal test may be the only test available in certain resource port settings for the diagnosis, diagnosis of enteric fever. Basically, what we kind of discussed in our course is you have to take the withal test with the entire clinical picture. You can't use that in isolation to make a diagnosis. Um, other infectious diseases such as dengue, malaria can call fa cause false positives, and positive test results might also reflect pre previous infection. So there is um, a vaccine against typhoid, um, but the rates of protection of available are not that great. So there are three vaccines currently licensed, two are commercially available, um, and a recent Cochrane uh, meta-analysis identified 17 randomized trials about the typhoid vaccines and showed both vaccines to be equally effective. There's a three-dose oral vaccine, which provided a protection rate of about 34 to 58%. The parenteral vaccine showed a cumulatively cumulative efficacy of about 30 to 70% for two years. Of note, these efficacy rates can't directly be used for travelers as the data was obtained by local populations and only an early trial with 20 participants calculated at 90% uh, protection rate in travelers, but that was obviously a small trial with 20 people. So last case um, before we end. Um, so this was actually a 33 year old physician who had been working in Liberia who presented with fever. Uh, while he was away, he was compliant with the medications and he took his daily malaria prophylaxis. Ten days after arriving home to Atlanta, he had subjective fevers and fatigue. At that time, his oral temperature was 37.8, so not febrile yet. He reported his symptoms to his colleagues and remained at home. Two rapid diagnostic tests for malaria were negative. He was started on empiric malaria treatment with artemeter and uh, lemifantrine, or the carwartum. Later that day, his temperature became 38.6 and he started getting nausea. Further testing, um, malaria RDT, yellow fever, Lassa fever, Ebola, RT-PCR were all negative. So what's your differential diagnosis at this point? For this physician who has been in Liberia um, with uh, fever, What are we thinking? 
fever, high fever, nausea, about 10 days after coming back home from Liberia. Okay, I see a few avian flu, Ebola, malaria. Any else? Any other answers? Okay, for the sake of time, I'm going to move this along. So over the next few days, the fevers continued. The patient was admitted to the hospital. It's treated with IV fluids and empiric antibiotics. On day four of illness, repeat uh, blood testing for malaria, yellow fever, Lassa fever, and Ebola were done, and the patient was positive for by PCR for Ebola. Um, day six, he developed a particular rash on his arms and chest. He had a fever, increased malaise. Um, the rash progressed. Day seven, he had hematemesis and received some blood. Um, he also received convalescent whole blood from a patient who had recovered from Ebola. He continued to worsen. During this time, he received supportive care with acetaminophen, oral hydration with Tang and Gatorade, as well as IV fluids. Day nine, he actually received a dose of Z map which is an experimental cocktail of three ebola glycogen glycoprotein specific monoclonal antibodies and uh within hours the medical team described improvements in his vital sign and alertness um and they also noticed that his rash decreased and his patient reported energy levels increased so he was able to walk day 10 he was in, uh, transferred to the icu at emory Day 11, he continued to be febrile um, and he re started requiring some oxygen. Day 14, um, he was the, had the lowest platelet count at 51,000. During this time, he continued to be IV fluid resuscitated because he continued to have diarrhea of two to four liters per day. Uh, day 15, he finally became a febrile. D between days 14 and 17, the volume of his stools decreased. Day 29, he was finally removed from isolation after two consecutive plasma specimens collected 24 hours apart, tested negative for Ebola on RT-PCR, and he was discharged home the following day. And this was actually a case described in the New England Journal of Medicine. So uh, e uh, viral hemorrhagic fever, specifically Ebola, um, predominantly found is endemic in Africa. And this particular physician was working in Liberia, where we can see um, there is an endemic Lhasa and there was an Ebola outbreak at the time. So takeaway points for us in the States, um, symptoms are include fever, severe headache, muscle pain, weakness, fatigue, diarrhea, vomiting, stomach pain, bleeding or bruising. There is up to a 90% death rate without prompt treatment. Um, it's transmitted, Ebola is transmitted only through direct contact with bodily fluid. There's a long incubation period, two to 21 days, or like a varying incubation period. Healthcare workers do not, who do not use proper protection and family and close relatives who are in close contact with patients are usually the highest risk of getting sick. There's no cure for Ebola. The two treatments that are approved by the FDA currently are monoclonal antibodies, Supportive care is the mainstay of treatment. Fluids, oxygen is needed for diarrhea, vomiting, pain, and blood pressure to maintain all of that. So if you can get patients through those acute kind of um, processes, um, the hope is that, you know, they can, uh, their immune system will kind of overcome, overcome the virus. Prevention is basically avoiding travel to such places, avoiding contact with sick people. And for healthcare workers, there is a pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, with a vaccine. Uh, Ebola is not considered a threat outside certain countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. 
And during the 2014 to 2016 outbreak, 11 people with Ebola were treated in the U.S. Nine contracted it while in Western Africa. Two of them died. One was a Liberian visiting the U.S. And another was a doctor who had treated an Ebola patient in Sierra Leone. And two American nurses actually contracted the disease while treating the Liberian patient, but both recovered. So how can you prevent uh, or help patients prevent and protect themselves while they're away? Firstly, we talked about chemoprophylaxis for malaria, antibiotics for travelers diarrhea for patients that are immunocompromised that may be susceptible to infection. So making sure patients have you know, certain antibiotics when they travel, vaccines, especially to hep A, hepatitis B, yellow fever, and typhoid, though we discussed that typhoid, um, the efficacy is not great. Behavioral modification, so using insect sprays, bed nets, um, drinking bottled water, not eating contaminated food, those are all really important. And risk avoidance, so avoiding traveling to maybe certain places during certain time of the year or avoiding contact with sick people. If you need help, the CDC website has a lot of information as well as the Infectious Disease Society of America. Um, one you, uh, resource that I picked up during my course was travelhealthpro.org.uk. It's excellent. You can actually type in the country and uh, it gives you kind of travel recommendations, what outbreaks are or diseases are, are um, there at the time. Um, it's really helpful. I have it booked out, bookmarked on my phone. And then obviously our ID colleagues are excellent resources for assistance and management. And these are some of my references. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you very much. Very, very, um, very, very timely lecture. And I really appreciate the audience participation mechanism. Uh, so do any, folks have any questions for Dr. Asson? Dr. O'Brien? Yes, uh, what are your thoughts about quinidine in a patient with falciparum malaria? I mean, if you have no therapeutic options and they're very sick, I, I mean, I've seen IV quinidine used before. I just wanted your thoughts. So unfortunately in the States, you know, with um, our testing not being FDA approved, so it's not readily available. Um, unfortunately, that that's kind of one of uh, the only options we have uh, for quinidine. And I agree that, um, you know, it's it's not the best, but when it's the only thing we have available, um, I think that's what we have to use. Um, I know in at TGH, um, there was a case um, in the last few months um, of, of a severe malaria patient, and unfortunately, they weren't able to secure the IV or testing in time from the CDC. Um, I think there, there was some difficulty in that, and I don't know if any of our ID colleagues are on board and can speak to that further. Um, this happened while I was away, so I don't have all the details, but, um, you know, in um, the absence of being able to secure a testing, and I think you treat with what we have. Seems like all the ID attendings are shy today. <laughs> I know we have a few ID attendings that I saw on the list. They may have had a run. Yes. <laughs> all right, any other questions? Those are a very good question, Dr. O'Brien. Yes. All right, Je Jen, any questions from the chat? Nope, we're good. All right. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate this. A really good talk. Uh, yeah, I'm going to break out some ID review articles tonight. You've inspired me. <laughs> so I'll be doing some reading. Uh, so thanks so much. And I appreciate everybody's attendance. Uh, another great crowd. Uh, thanks, Jen, for all the technical support as always. And we'll see you next week. Uh, for um, a, a talk on uh, lupus. Uh, so uh, we haven't had one of those in a while. So uh, just like we haven't had a traveler's talk in a while. So uh, thank you for your support of our Grand Rounds and have a great day. Thank you all.